So hi, everybody. Um, thank you for um, joining this week's uh, Magnet Seminar. Um, it's good to see another great turnout of people. We've got over 50 people uh, already. And I'm sure there'll be a few more uh, jumping in uh, last minute. So for those who um, haven't, aren't too familiar with the Magnet Seminars, we have um, a 25 to, to 30 minute presentation. And so we just kindly ask that you keep your uh, microphones muted um, during the, pre the presentation. If you do have any um, connection issues, um, turning off your, your video feed can also help to, to improve um, uh, connection. Um, at the end of the seminar, we'll have a chance for a 10 to 15 minute um, chit chat and discussion. So we welcome questions um, either um, um, via video and microphone, but if you don't want to ask a question yourself, please just type it into the chat and um, either myself or, or one of the other conveners will uh, read it out for you. And as always, most of us are, are working at home in, in various forms of home offices. So if you do have to go halfway through the seminars, uh, just go, it's not a problem. There'll be a recording made available on YouTube uh, later on. And at the very end of the seminar, we have a chance for a bit of social catch up with everybody. Um, and none of that's recorded. So it's a bit of a free for all just to chit chat and catch up with everybody. Um, and so today I'm really pleased to say that we have Phil Livermore from uh, the University of Leeds, uh, just up the road from us in Liverpool. And he's going to be talking about uh, archaeo intensity spikes uh, in the Levant region. So I will hand over to you, Phil. Thank you. And a uh, very good morning to you all from Leeds. Can I just check that you can all see that? Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, yes. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you uh, today about some, some work that I've been uh, undertaking recently with uh, my collaborators on this, Yves Gallet and Alex Fournier in Paris, um, which is focused on understanding archaeomagnetic intensity variations, in particular, the proposed geomagnetic spikes in the, in the uh, Levant. And um, an alternative title to this talk is really counting spikes in noisy data, which really uh, gets to the heart of, of, of what I'm um, going to tell you about. So the, the story of the geomagnetic spikes starts about, started about a, a decade ago with the publication of, of several papers uh, where the authors looked at, at uh, several archaeomagnetic sites in the Levant region, which includes modern day Israel and Jordan. And they, they looked at slag deposits, which are waste deposits from Iron Age uh, copper smelting sites. Um, and if, in particular, these sites were very well stratified. So the oldest stuff at the top, the most recent, uh, sorry, the oldest stuff at the bottom, the most recent at the top, everything's very well layered. Uh, and, and because of this, the authors were able to propose a very tight sequential chronology uh, based on this, on this uh, well-defined stratification. Um, and the authors analyzed various slag and pottery samples for paleo intensity. Um, and they also uh, dated some of the layers using carbon-14 analysis. And what they found was quite staggering. Uh, and that was two, two proposed uh, spikes in the geomagnetic field, uh, one about 980 BC and one about 890. Uh, so set, set upon a background of fairly, uh, not quite sedate, but fairly, fairly low level second variation, these two spikes show massive intensity increases uh, of about a factor of 100% only over a few decades. And in the intervening 10 years since, since these studies first came out, uh, whilst of course the data set has, uh, has improved, it's increased in number, has been updated, been refined by improved uh, criteria for data selection, nevertheless there remains strong evidence of rapid change. Um, and the, the, the essence of the talk really is about how we construct a, a curve through the, uh, the, the, the data set, um, which is an expanded version of what you see in front of you, um, and how we use that to understand geomagnetic spikes. 
So geomagnetic spikes occurred during what's termed the Levantine Iron Age anomaly, which was a, 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 a temporal high in the intensity. Uh, here you can see uh, several uh, global magnetic field models uh, plotted uh, in amongst the individual data uh, localized to this region. So why is it important to understand these spikes? Well, crucially, there's no historical or modern day analog to, to these. These are the only, uh, these are the only known occurrence of such rapid magnetic field change that we have. And indeed, if you look at the typical uh, rate of change of intensity, uh, 0.75 to about two and a half microteslas a year, this is somewhere between five and 20 times the present day maximum rate of change of intensity. So there's definitely something here to explain and understand. Spikes are really difficult to reproduce in, in geodynamo models. So there's, there's a gap in our, in our understanding. To, to make the magnetic, to, to, to explain magnetic field change, we either need to, to rely on one of one or both of two processes. One is advection of magnetic field and stretching within Earth's liquid core. And the other is diffusion of magnetic field from within the core. But it's true, it, it, it's, it's the case that such rapid intensity changes definitely challenges our understanding of, of, of these processes. So either we need anomalously fast flows or we need some form of abnormal emergence of magnetic field from within the core that can explain these features. So in order to um, analyze this, we, we collected all published archaeomagnetic data uh, in the region of 1200 to 500 BC, which, which roughly uh, defines the periods um, of, of uh, geomagnetic spikes. And these were all reduced to Palmyra in Syria, which was roughly at the center point of the data set. The, the published archaeomagnetic data are heterogeneous, by which I mean they, they either refer to fragment level or thermal unit level samples. So for example, a shard, a brick or a kiln, or they refer to a group level average over some number of fragments, which are assumed to be of the same age. Uh, so in, in the figure, you can see the, the data set that we collected from the literature. Uh, and you can also see a global model, which is the Shaw-Q uh, Iron Age model uh, showing the general trend uh, of, or showing, showing the, the general trend according to that model uh, in the region. And you can see the discrepancy of the fragment of, of some of these, uh, of these samples um, extending way beyond the two sigma error bounds of the model. Most of the data I showed is fragment level data. And so for most of this presentation, I'm going to focus on this data set. And here we see all the fragment level samples uh, as a, a plotted uh, with uh, intensity and age. And, and the, the key question is, what is the intensity curve, the variation of the intensity with time that's consistent with this data set? And from that curve, we can then assess the number and the nature of, of the geomagnetic spikes. And it's important that we have such a curve because it's very hard otherwise to objectively assess whether or not we've had rapid intensity change. As an example of that, uh, this is, uh, these are the data points around 980 uh, BC where one of the spikes were proposed, which seems to fit well with the data set as shown in the, in the, in the figure. Here's, here's another of the spikes which are proposed. Okay, you might think that, sound, that, that looks uh, all very convincing, but the more you look, of course, the more spikes you see. So here's, here's some more data which look uh, that, like that might uh, define a spike, and here's some others, and you can keep going. And you see, the more you look, you see spikes everywhere. Uh, so this is, this, there probably aren't so many spikes in this data set, but we need some way of op to objectively assess uh, what, what, what's going on. 
Uh, I mentioned the fragment data set, uh, but if we look uh, only at the data defined by averages uh, of, of n data points that seem to be of the same age, then, then of course the, the, there are much fewer uh, members of this data set. And um, here they are, and I'll come back to these uh, towards the end of the presentation. So the key question is how do we fit a model to these data? The data are, are non-uniform in time. So there are some times where there are more, uh, more data than others. The, the data are uncertain intensity and the uncertainties are, are different for each data point. The uh, samples all have uncertainty in age and some of the samples are age ordered specifically those derived from the stratified data sets that I, I uh, introduced right at the start of the presentation. On the, on the modeling side, what kind, of, what kind of properties of model might we want? Well, ideally we want a model that is as simple as possible. And you could say has a minimal curvature that is required by the data. We don't want to overfit the data. We want a simple model as possible. We'd also like a model that can handle rapid variations at some times, but steady variations at other times. So we'd like some kind of modeling that can accommodate multiple time scales. Uh, and we'd also, of course, like to have some handle on the uncertainty of any, any model fit. So fitting, fitting data or fitting model fits through data is a very common practice in, in the geomagnetism uh, community. Um, and typically when people construct global, uh, global geomagnetic models, rather than local models like I'm going to talk about here. Uh, typically what people do is they introduce a model and they, uh, then they uh, smooth it using some, some form of, of, of global penalization of complexity. The disadvantage with that is it doesn't really allow for multiple time scales. You typically have a similar smoothing of the model everywhere. What I'm going to talk today uh, about is a, is a new approach, which is a ba based on ma uh, Bayesian modeling, which doesn't have any explicit damping, where the data self-select times uh, where rapid change is needed. And this modeling process provides formal uncertainties. So Bayesian methods are named after Thomas Bayes, who was an 18th century statistician, after whom a very famous, uh, famous Bayes formula uh, that you see in front of you uh, was named. This formula relates the what's termed the posterior probability, which is a probability of a model, that's the thing we'd like, given the data set D, uh, to various things. So uh, the posterior probability is the product of something called the likelihood here, which is the, which is the probability of the data given a model, times a prior uh, divided by a normalization factor here, which is the, called the evidence. So what we'd like uh, to find is the posterior distribution of some time dependent models given the data set. Now we can only really do this numerically. And so what we do is we create an ensemble uh, using something termed a Monte Carlo Markov chain process, MCMC. I'll describe that in, uh, I'll describe that briefly. Uh, and when we create the ensemble, the models with higher probability are sampled more often. And we need some way to characterize our model ensemble. So the way I'm going to uh, describe this is by using the median median model. However, of course, we have the full statistics of the model. Uh, so in terms of the model, uh, what do I mean? Well, the model is a piecewise linear fit through, through the data. Um, and there are a whole bunch of unknowns here the number of the interior vertices, so the number of, of linear segments of this, of this uh, linear fit is unknown, as are the position of the interior vertices. So in other words, where the, the points at which the linear segments to uh, connect with each other. Uh, in, our, in our modeling process, we also allow the data ages to be found by the model. So the data ages themselves are unknown and we explore the model space using a random walk. <clears throat> Any Bayesian procedure uh, 
uh, needs to define prior information, which is the information, it's, it's, our, it's a formulation of our beliefs on the probability uh, prior to the uh, introduction of any data. Uh, and so we need to propose some prior distributions on the number of vertices and the age and intensity of each internal uh, vertex. And we also need to impose a distribution of, on, on each uh, data mage. And all of these prior distributions are, are reasonable. Um, and I'll point you to the reference where you can uh, look up exactly what we've done at the end. We also need to, we also need to uh, have a, a, or decide upon a likelihood, which we assume to be normally distributed. The method I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm describing is, is trans-dimensional, which is a fancy word for really saying that the number of model parameters is also an unknown. So in other words, the number of linear segments is not, is not determined by, by the user, it's determined by the data themselves. Uh, and there's no explicit regularization. There's no, there's no damping applied. Uh, instead, we rely upon the natural, uh, the natural nature of Bayesian methods to be parsimonious, that is to, to favor low dimensional models uh, above complex models. Uh, the, each model is a, is a piecewise linear uh, fit, but when you average them, you get a smooth evolution as I'll demonstrate shortly. Okay, so this modeling process, uh, we've, we've named age hyperparameter reverse jump Monte Carlo Markov chain. It's a very long title and I'll just break it down for you a little bit. So age hyperparameter means that the data ages are part of the model. So as part of the statistics that we generate, we, all, we, we not only derive the intensity evolution, but we also uh, calculate the, um, the full statistics of all the data ages as well. Reverse jump just means that the algorithm can reverse up and down the, the uh, dimensionality of the system. So that is, we can, we can look for both simple and complex models and traverse between them. And then this bit at the end, the Monte Carlo Markov chain basically means it's an intelligent random walk through model space. So I just wanted to describe to you a few, a few results that uh, accompanied the, the paper that described this method uh, a few years ago now, before we get onto the Levantine uh, data set. This data set I'm showing you here, we term Paris 700. It's a, it's a data set of RQ intensity uh, samples, all found within 700 kilometers of Paris. You can see here plotted uh, intensity against time. And we've, we're going to, I'm going to show you what happens when we apply this method through, through these data. So this is what happens. You can see the, the data set in front of you with the error bars. And I've characterized this uh, distribution of models, uh, which is the posterior distribution, uh, by the average, the median, and the mode in different colors. Uh, and they pretty much over, overlap each other. Uh, and you can see a measure of uncertainty of this Bayesian uh, modeling uh, by the 95% credible intervals. So there's, 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 a, there's a few things that are of note here. Firstly, where the data require complicated time dependence, then the model accommodates that by, being, uh, by showing uh, very strong time dependence. For example, you can see um, there's very well resolved oscillations in intensity. However, where the data do not require complex time dependence, uh, none is, none is uh, returned. And, and so you can see this very uh, simple constant fit through the intensity because the data are simply happy uh, uh, for that, that that is a consistent model and does, uh, they don't require any additional complexity. And if you're interested, you can find this, uh, this modeling. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, I'm not going to give you a live demonstration of it now, uh, but, but the, uh, the model is actually coded in Fortran for speed. And all you need to do is, if you, if you, is go to the GitHub repository, download it, compile it, uh, configure the input file, 
and then run the code. And a typical ensemble size of about 5 million ensemble members takes about a minute on a laptop. So it's very quick. And you'll also find the data sets in the Python scripts that generate all the figures that I'll show today. So what happens when we apply this modeling procedure to the Levantine data set? Well, in this figure, I showed you, I'm showing you the fragment level data set with the error bars uh, on intens intensity and age. And in purple, you can see the median of this, uh, on, of this Bayesian uh, model fit to the data. And in the panel beneath, beneath that in, in red, you can see the rate of change of, of this median curve as a function of time. So as I said, I, I've, I've showed you the original fragment level data set to accompany this figure. But as I mentioned earlier, the, metal, uh, sorry, the, the, the method also gives you statistics on the sample age themselves. And, and so the method actually gives a preferred age and intensity uh, for each sample. Okay, and I'm going to show you what that looks like now. Um, so you can see that the, the samples move closer to the curve, of course, because they're, uh, everything's trying to be consistent. There are, locate, there are some times where the samples don't apparently seem to match the curve, but of course these samples are, are pulled uh, to the left and to the right. Uh, so um, because I'm plotting the median age uh, as derived by this modeling process, the, the ages lie in between the two branches of the curve. That's why they fall in the middle. Okay, so having found a, a way of fitting a, a curve through the data set, we'd like, we now like to try to characterize the geomagnetic spikes uh, and in order to do that, we needed to write down what a spike was. And so we proposed a number of characteristics. So the first of which is that a geomagnetic spike represents a peak in intensity and in particular exceeds a neighboring minimum by five microtesla. So in other words, it's a well-pronounced peak in intensity. Uh, the second criteria is on the rate of change. And in particular, a, a spike uh, must have a high rate of change, and at some point it, it exceeds the present day rate of change, which is about uh, 0.12 uh, microteslas a year. And the times at which this happens then defines the width of the spike. So we have some way of defining when the spike starts and when, and when it ends. And the spike also needs to represent a nominally large intensity variation, which we take to mean greater than 0.6 microteslas a year. And these definitions build upon other, other proposals in the literature. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is that our de our, the, the definition of the spikes here has no defined time scale. So spikes could be 10 years long, they could also be 100 years long. So what happens when we apply our definition of spikes then to the intensity variation curve? Well, we actually find six geomagnetic spikes that are consistent with the data, according to the fragment level uh, data set. And I've, uh, I've drawn the duration of the spike uh, within, within the blue boxes. So six blue boxes, uh, each defining a spike, and each has a star with a different color. Uh, and so you can see uh, clearly where the where the center points of the spikes are and their age. So importantly, two of these spikes are, have already been proposed in the literature, but there are four others which are new, at least new in the sense that they've not been spotted before, but of course this is all based upon existing data. So these are new spikes, but discovered in the existing data set. And what can we say about the duration of spikes? Um, well, if we, if we chop out the spikes from the uh, intensity variation curve and we plot them on a centered age, age figure like this, so they're all stacked one on top of the other. Of course, they're all the six spikes 
all in different colors, we can we can very easily see uh, how how long the the spikes have, have have lasted, and they vary from the shortest spike of about thirty years, which is the yellow one, uh, right up to a hundred years, which is the purple one, and they're generally symmetric in age, but they're not necessarily. For example, the blue the blue spike uh, in the middle here you can see is a little bit skewed to one side. Uh, I, I lastly want to say something very briefly about the sensitivity of the of this conclusion and of the geomagnetic spikes. Um, so not 93 of the 139 date, uh, fragment level data contain very small intensity errors, which might be underestimates of the of their true intensity error. And so what we can do is we can test the sensitivity of this by sequentially increasing the minimum intensity error from zero uh, up to three, four, five, and six microteslas. So by increasing the error budget, of course, what we might expect is that we can fit an ever smoother curve through the data and thereby the number of spikes would go down. <clears throat> So this is what we find if we impose a minimum of three microteslas intensity error. Uh, the six spikes reduced to five spikes, but not by an awful lot. There used to be a spike here at about 790 BC, which only marginally doesn't fulfill our, our criterion for being a spike. Okay, so it's, it's, all, it's almost six spikes. So this, this minimum of three microteslas doesn't make an awful lot of difference to our conclusions. But as you start to increase the uh, intensity error budget, our six spikes now drop to four. When we reach a five microtesla uh, threshold, uh, we, we drop down now to one spike. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, value for the in uncertainty in intensity because it's a level of uncertainty considered by other authors. I'm also showing here in green the Shaw-Q Iron Age model that I've shown right at the start, which is beginning to look quite similar to this smoother intensity evolution. And as we go up to six microteslas, uh, we're now dropping, we've now dropped to zero spikes and the evolution now very closely follows this Shaw-Q Iron Age model. I mentioned right at the start that there was not only a fragment level data set for the Levantine region, but the group level data set, which comprised averages over at least N fragments assumed dated at the same age. These were the data sets. Um, and what happens when we apply our analysis to these? Well, we don't see many spikes at all. For the, for the group level uh, data set, consisting of averages over at least two samples, we find only one spike. Um, and if we increase the stringency of the averaging to at least three fragments, uh, we find no spikes. These, these data points are, are the posterior median intensity and age. Uh, so they're the, they're the corresponding data, which is most consistent um, with, with the intensity evolution. Okay, so I was going to wrap up here. Uh, so what I've talked about here is the area of geomagnetic spikes, and I think it gives a really unique opportunity to study very rapid intensity change. Uh, I've briefly introduced a Bayesian method that's ideally suited to characterizing rapid changes in intensity. And taken at face value, the fragment level data set appears to require six spikes, which is a lot more than, than has been proposed so far in the literature. Um, and if you, if you reassess the data, either by looking, looking at the group averaging or by increasing the error budget, you get a, a smoother variation and fewer spikes. So the real take home message here is that the Levantine data set may require more complex behavior than previously thought during this, this era, era of spikes. And this raises challenging questions for core modelers like myself 
um, to try and explain uh, what, what was going on during that time. Um, right at the bottom here is a reference uh, which, for a paper which recently came out describing uh, what I presented today um, with a lot more detail. And there's a, a reference here right at the bottom for the code that I introduced earlier that you, that you can freely download and run. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much, Phil. That was a really interesting talk. Um, we can all give Phil a, a, a virtual uh, round of applause um, through Zoom. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be an absolute ton of questions because that was a really, uh, uh, personally, I find that a really exciting talk. So um, I will open the floor to questions and I can see that uh, Andy Biggin uh, is the first uh, with his hand up. Hi, Phil. Hi, Andy. Um, nice talk. Um, yeah, I just wondered, um, have you looked at relative errors at all, rather than applying an absolute error, allowing it to scale with the actual paleo intensity itself? Because that might be a more realistic way of looking at it. Uh, that is a good question. And we did think very carefully about what errors to use. Um, in the paper, I, I, well, I didn't really want to go too much into this in the talk, uh, just to keep it snappy. Um, but in the paper, we do discuss this at, at some length, and we we tried using uh, what some of the authors uh, uh, of of the Levantine data uh, called an extended uh, intensity error. Um, so we 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 tried to look at reasonable choices for yes for the intensity error. Um, and um, well, you can read about it in the paper, but basically it doesn't really change our, our conclusion. All right, thanks. Thanks, Andy. So um, Kathy Constable is the next uh, with her hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed your talk presentation, Phil. Uh, I just wanted to um, raise a comment. You mentioned that uh, Chris and I in our papers in 2017, 2018, had difficulty finding spikes in numerical dynamo models. And I think that's not a completely accurate characterization of um, what, we, what we said in those papers. We did actually find quite a number of spikes in dynamo models, whether they would meet the criteria that you specify here, um, we haven't explicitly tested, um, yeah. but we did actually look for rapid changes in the field and found quite a number in terms of the field strength. So I'd say it was still um, a fairly open question as to whether we find these things in the numerical simulations. And there is, of course, some difficulty in deciding what the time scale they're occurring on would be. Yes, thank you. That's, that's a good point, Cathy. Um, in, in one of your studies with Chris, you also looked at the localization of the spikes, which is a, which mm -hmm. is a, a broad question that I've not really touched upon here. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and as to whether, whether the spikes are are seen only in one place or in a broader region? And I think that's, that's another interesting question. Yeah, I think that uh, inevitably, if they're coming from the core, then they have to occur over a broader region. Mm. Uh, uh, that's uh, certainly an interesting question for the that the paleomagnetic data ought to be able to address, as well as the numerical simulations. Yeah. And in the numerical simulations, we saw that the biggest changes in intensity seem to occur at higher generally at mid to high la latitudes rather than at low latitudes. So you're kind of in between. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Cathy. Um, we'll move on to, to Gunther. Well, first, let me thank you, Phil. It was really good to talk and I like it because it was very calm and there was assurance given. And oh. so <laughs> well, thank you. It was very nice to listen to. And uh, I have a question. Uh, I mean, you talk about spikes. Uh, why don't you talk about dips? Because it looks like dips should work the same way. <laughs> yes, you're quite right. Maybe we should, have, we should have inverse spikes or something. Yes, that's right. So uh, let me find a picture. Um, so yes, so you're quite right. Um, I, I guess it's we're really following our lead from the original papers that spotted this very rapid intensity, um, intensity change. 
Um, but you are, but you are quite right in that uh, the 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 concerns about getting intensity decreases also pertain to intensity decreases as well, because it's the same pro physical process that you'd need to explain uh, both of both of these. But Thank you. we haven't we haven't actually looked at at uh, dips as you as you as you put it only the spikes. Thank you. Cheers, so. cheers, good start. Um, uh, Lisa, I, you have your hand up now. Um, I have a, a. Thank you, Phil. That was a great talk. I really liked thank it. You, Lisa. Um, uh, I have a comment and a question. The first, the comment, and that is that you're using the term spike and words matter. So, in a different sense than we use the term spike, we define a spike as being something with a uh, a VADM higher than 160 zeta ammeter squared. Yeah. And it that's not the way you're using it. So I think you should use a different term. Uh, peak, I don't know. Um, in, I, I, you know, some other word because it becomes very confusing. Also, if you start to use the word dip, note that Dennis can't defined that decrease in paleo intensity many years ago. And so you should look into how he defined that because we end up with too many words, meaning too many different things and nobody knows what each other is talking about. The second uh, point is a question. And that is in your uh, Bayesian modeling, you're allowing um, points to migrate, which Bayesian methods allow you to do. And I think yeah. that's powerful. The uh, my question is that do you end up with an age model for specimens that violate stratigraphy? Because there are in some of these sample data sets like uh, 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 the Timna 30 and the uh, uh, Megiddo one, you know, you, unless people were messing around and taking things that are older and putting them up in a younger strata, you have a pretty good constraint of age ordering. And I'm just curious, if your model <clears throat> ends up violating that or whether you take that into account? Yeah, it's a really good question, uh, Lisa. And it's something that we were very conscious and careful of to retain the stratigraphy of the, oh, okay. of the samples because we're, we're, we're well aware that this is a really robust um, finding from, from, from the data. And so in all, all these models, where, wherever there are um, age ordering, uh, these are um, these are taken into account by the modeling. Okay. So so when it, so you yeah you mentioned that the the ages were perturbed, they are perturbed, <coughs> but, on, but only if they are consistent with the strat with the stratification constraints. Oh okay, all right. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Lisa. And does anybody else have a, a question to throw Phil's way? Nobody's going to jump to put hands up. I can throw, uh, well, I'll let Brendan, I'll let Brendan uh, jump in with his question first. Yeah, so I guess uh, this, is, this is a very technical question, hmm. but um, for your points, like in your sort of third and fourth spike around that area where you might have like a bimodal distribution that you end up with for the ages yeah how how does like what does your sample convergence look like for that so how well does your how well does your sample converge for things where you've got like a, a bimodal distribution of ages um so in in you're, you're right to uh to, to raise the question of model convergence so is it this is because it's all based on a numerical sampling a numerical sampling strategy. You have to make sure that you take enough samples that your your distribution and any statistics derived from that settle down. And we were very careful to do that. We didn't look specifically at these bimodal uh, times, uh, but but we we basically ran the model for a very large number of 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 iterations into the hundreds of millions. Um, in order to to be absolutely certain that everything was well converged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much, Brendan. Does anybody else um, have questions for for Phil? 
Oh, Kathy, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, I, I, it, since there's a, a dearth of questions, maybe we'll <laughs> get a chance to ask his, but I want to know what you think is going on when you <laughs> get two spikes within 30 years of each other at 970 and 940 BC. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of left myself open for that, Kathy. Uh, um, yeah, as I said here, it ra this raises challenging questions for core modelers. So it was hard enough to explain two spikes, let alone six. Um, what is what is going on? Well, if if this is really what happened, then in order to get such a such a a quasi periodic signal. Uh, the only things that I can think of that might explain this is some kind of wave uh, wave propagation, uh, which has peaks and troughs. Uh, the other way of getting it would be to have some some form of magnetic structure, which is sequentially or maybe of different sign. So as it emerges from the core, you get an enhancement and then a reduction in the intensity, followed by a further enhancement and a, a reduction. Either way, it's it's challenging to think of how how this is uh, how this how this happened physically. Um, so I don't really have any good answers, Kathy. It's a great question, though. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. So that sounds like there's some sort of Mexican wave in the core that's giving us this bumpy <laughs> behavior. I so I, I guess actually, then, kind of, I'm just going to jump jump in before anybody else has a question. Uh, I guess that kind of leads nicely to what I'm thinking. In terms of, of the detailed analyses that you've done, you know, what what would you tell um, the experimentalists, the archaeomagnetists, in terms of, of what you would like to see um, from the data? What time periods, what um, information um, should we be aiming for? In an ideal world, assuming we could go out and find those perfect samples. Yeah, well. The uh, the Levantine region is is amazingly well sampled, uh, so we've got yeah taken at the fragment level at least there's loads of, of loads of data which is fantastic a fantastic resource. I guess what we're missing here is a comparison to data which are averaged over a number of fragments so that one can be absolutely certain. Of the values of intensity and also the the error you that are attached um, to them, um, I guess that's the only thing I I can say. I I, I know I know from the discussions I've had with the various people who have who have analysed this data that that um, that you you all very you know there's there's a lot of certainty and a, a lot of confidence in in these data points and I'm I'm not. I'm not questioning that at all. Um, I'm just trying to think of ways that uh, the conclusions derived from the fragment level um, data set might be also supported uh, by, by um, other data sets, for example, by this average data set. Thanks very much. Um, we've got two, we'll put two more questions and then we'll, we'll draw it to a close. So Lisa? You're still on mute. So I was complimenting you, um, uh, but um, my question is now, um, it seems to me that since each, are the, at least the, the group Ranshar Eras and, and I have, our philosophy of how to deal with the data has been changing mm. through time and we're trying to get better <laughs> and, uh, and there may be uh, better ways to do it now. I think uh, some of you have heard of uh, Brandon Seish's um, Bayesian approach to to coming up with what's the best what's the best intensity <laughs> for a particular fragment, for example. But then to propagate those uncertainties that you get, or those uh, credible intervals, or um, from uh, a consistent um, better analysis all the way up into the model, that would be my vision of how we can move forward. So um, 
that because you have data from many different labs, um, different approaches, different methods, and uh, and so each one of these does have a ha, there's different uncertainties built into it, and it seems to me I've been trying very hard to get all of the data from our group into the magic database with the measurement level data, and so that it could be treated in an in an agnostic way. Um, and a consistent way. And then we would start from the measurements of the actual fragments and then move up and propagate the uncertainties up into your model and a proceed like that. And it seems to me that um, th that would overcome a lot of, of uh, argument <laughs> about, you know, is that particular data point any good or not? or was it curved or was it blah, 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 you know, all those arguments that we have every day. Um, uh, and it might be a way forward, I'm just thinking. But we don't have, uh, some people haven't put their data into the MAGIC database. Yeah. Or we don't have access to the measurement level data. Your buddy Galay, maybe Yves Galay could be convinced to put it into some way and it could be treated in a, a consistent way, you know, um, you, you get what I mean, right? I do, Lisa. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. 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 So if Dokia, you can put your data into the <laughs> mass collection, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. It's not so easy. I, I, I tried. No, I know. I know. If you need help, we can help. Thank you, I appreciate it. Pain in the butt. Thanks very much, Lisa. So we'll move on. Uh, if Dokia, is your question a quick one? Yes, it's quite quick. Okay. I? We'll go for the last one, last well, quick question, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for this nice presentation and this very nice discussion. I, I am very surprised by the fact that spikes disappear when we, we deal with mean site mean values. I was wondering if you have an explanation on that. And uh, I am also wondering if are they are um, taking into account the single fragment, uh, if it really shows and corresponds to a real spike fast variation, or it could be also an um, not real effect, but like, uh, let's say, uh, something that get introduced by the error on uh, on the samples or maybe possible uh, errors of archaeologists or collections. I'm not re uh, referring only to the Levantine uh, collection that is uh, very well studied, but in general. And the last point that I was wondering also, when dealing with such data, and many times we take data from um, like Geomagia data set, where actually we have uh, the mean values, the site mean values. What uh, do you suggest? It's very close to the Greg's uh, uh, suggestion. How can we uh, plot the fragment uh, values when all other data to, to use to compare with our site means? Thank you. Um, well, I can certainly answer the first of your, your questions. Uh, so you, yeah, you raise an interesting point here about the data set uh, derived from group level averages of, of fragments. Uh, and so, yes, there is indeed only one spike detected in the in, in, in the top figure here. And you can see it, it largely hinges upon one single data point, which is, which is from Turkey. Um, the reason why it's a spike there, I think, uh, is because the error bars are quite tight. Um, the, the reason why there aren't other spikes is simply because the... Uh, the data don't require the uh, the other the other five um, spikes um, mainly because there aren't that many data points um, in the fragment level data set. There are 139 uh, data points here. There are only 20 or 30, uh, and so really, it, this what 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 you're seeing here, uh, this rather simple change, is really a manifestation of the, of the lack of data that we have that can that can really uh, describe rapid change. Uh, and as, as more data points are added to this collection, 
the, the more spikes may become apparent. But at the moment, this is the simplest model that fits all the data. And so the data don't require anything more complicated. So you suggest to use fragment levels to plot our data? Well, I mean, there's a choice. I mean, you, you can either choose the fragment level data and then you get more, obviously, then you get loads of data, which is great. And then, uh, and that, that then shows that you need six spikes or you go with the group level data set uh, and, you, and you just can see that you just don't have that many data and you can fit a simple model through them. So thanks very much. I'm just going to uh, cut you. it short there and, and we'll uh, wrap up um, today's seminar. Thank you again to Phil um, for a, uh, another uh, fantastic pr uh, presentation. And just allow me to share. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Phil. It's a, a fantastic presentation and another um, really good um, turnout this week. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we, uh, before we go. Um, we're going to take another short break. This is this is a kind of a, a one-off um, presentation in between some uh, conferences. So we've just had EGU. We'll have a short break for the uh, IRM conference in Santa Fe, um, and we'll be returning for the next magnets on uh, June sixteenth, which will be given by uh, Andy Roberts from Australia uh, National University. So at this point, we will actually be switching the time um, of. Um, the seminars. So we'll be switching to a time zone that's a little bit more friendly for um, uh, the Europe and Eastern Hemisphere region. And so our presentations are going to be um, either 8 or 9 a.m. Um, UK time. And it's going to be a little bit of flexibility to accommodate uh, whether our speaker is uh, in, in Europe or whether they're in uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, we've got a couple more speakers um, lined up for, for um, seminars afterwards. Um, we'll com confirm those uh, details a little bit later. But we are um, looking for uh, more presenters. Um, and in particular, we really want to encourage um, early career um, scientists, uh, early career researchers to, to use magnets as a chance to uh, present some of their work because right now it's, it's not easy to go and visit um, uh, all the big fancy conferences. And magnets is, I think, a, a really good friendly atmosphere um, for uh, ECRs to, to uh, present their new research. Uh, and so, and it's one of the reasons actually why um, we, we set up this uh, seminar series was to get um, early career scientists recognized so that people uh, know who they are. So please encourage um, any of your ECRs or, or yourself, if you are an ECR here who's thinking about uh, giving a presentation. So just reach out to, to, to myself uh, or to Anita and, um, yeah, just thank you everybody for um, joining uh, this seminar. Thank you very much.